Is this on? Can you hear me? It works, okay. Thank you, David, and thank you, Harry. I'm delighted to be here. If for no other reason than I can finally explain to you what on earth we're doing up in that little office on the fifth floor. As you all pass by, I'm sure you're wondering. So this is a, a whirlwind tour of the project, which I hope will make some sense. It's, it's a very good exercise, trying to condense two years' work into 20 minutes. It's probably shockingly easy to condense two years' work into 20 minutes, actually. So, um, yes, the full title of the project is something of a mouthful. It's the role of the architect in the production of public spaces, colon, a comparative study of influential modernist and contemporary examples in London and Sao Paulo. And uh, it's a collaboration between the University of Westminster, funded by the Arts and Humanities Council, and the University of Sao Paulo, funded by the State of Sao Paulo. Besides me, the team consists of two research associates, and I'm going to embarrass them by pointing them out, because I think it's good for the faculty to know who they are. The first is Dan Jessen, who is a practicing architect and partner of EAST, which has designed award-winning public spaces in London. And the second is Dr. Neil Chassaw, who's hiding back there, who's an architectural historian who specializes in post-war and pre-war architecture and culture. So we're examining 16 public spaces, designed public spaces, four modernist ones and four contemporary ones per city and trying to draw conclusions of some use to public space production today. Uh, I always do this, I've got such bad manners. I particularly want to thank our project partners, and I particularly want to thank the RIBA of our project partners. They've all been fantastically supportive, and uh, we couldn't do this without them. We certainly couldn't disseminate this without them. Right, onward. So these are the modernist case studies. We also have eight contemporary case studies, four in London and four in Sao Paulo. The reasons why we chose these take too long to go into. I've only got 20 minutes. So if you're interested, we are, of course, more than happy to explain the methodology of this project in greater detail at some other point. So the social and physical health of a city can be measured, among other things, by the condition and use of its public spaces. They're a barometer of a city's success or failure to promote a public realm that is stable enough to tolerate differences in their various forms, and some of them are very various. This, of course, requires us to define what we mean by public and public space. Hannah Arndt's definition of public in the human condition is very useful because it leads us to the humanly produced world, which of course includes the city, which in turn includes architects as some makers of cities. So this is her definition. She says, the word public signifies the world itself, insofar as it is common to all of us and distinguished from our privately owned place within it. This world, however, is not identical with the earth or with nature. It is related rather to the human artifact, the fabrication of human hands, as well as to affairs which go on among, among those who inhabit the man-made world together, i.e. us. So there are two kinds of affairs that go on in public space. The first is episodic and politically activated in which public space is taken over ad hoc when needed. And some of you may recognize this photograph from Hong Kong during weeks of protests against the mainland Chinese government when part of the highway system in the business district was literally annexed by protesters and became, to use Chantal Mouffe's term, agonistic space, that is, contested territory. This isn't what we experience from day to day. The other set of affairs that go on in public space 
our everyday ones. They are our private comings and goings and our civic meetings and rituals acted out in public spaces intended for them. The project addresses these second everyday public spaces because they're intentionally designed. And this is where architects operate as architects, whatever they get up to as citizens. One thing we discovered, that's everyday public space. One thing we discovered very early on was the vast amount of media and academic attention devoted to the subject of public space at the moment. There's an anxiety about a perceived onward march of privatized public space and a threat to democracy. There's too much surveillance, too many prohibitions, too little access. We should ask, but not many do, compared to what? When you do ask, it quickly becomes clear that in terms of our cultural memory, this is most recently in comparison to the three decades of the mid 20th century, when public space was in large part produced by the state, maintained by the state for the public good. Even during this halcyon period, however, its use was never unconditional. There was never a time when you could do exactly what you wanted to in public space. And these are GLC bylaws. And if you look at the public meetings section, you can see that there are quite precise strictures on public expression. You can only express yourself from sunrise to sunset and only in certain places in open places. So the, the, the idea that there was a, a golden age of unconditional inhabitation of open space, public space, is not the case. There have always been and always will be laws and bylaws governing its use, whether those laws are to ensure safety and enjoyment for all or exclude some in favor of others. So the current anxieties about the public of public space aren't new and are obscuring questions about the space of public space, questions that are equally relevant to its success or failure. There's an important representational function to designed public space, which puts the designer front, if not center. Though architects in the mid 20th century were inclined to assume that architects were front and center. This is Louis Kahn in the 1960s. The architect, as guardian of the public realm, should maintain independence from clients' demands because clients are constrained by budget, self-interest, and at times the lack of a broad social vision, the responsibility falls to the architect to imagine a form that is good for man. This is both preposterous and thought-provoking and characteristic of a time when there was little doubt about the right or the capacity of the architect to build a new society as well as a new city, or rather that in building a new city, you'd get a new society. It also throws into relief the much more complex situation that architects find themselves in today. No contemporary architect in their right mind would declare her or himself the guardian of the public realm, even if they secretly harbored that desire. Which is why this project looks at public spaces produced in two time periods, the mid 20th century and now, and two hemispheres, the northern and the southern, to get the full measure of this change in the role of the architect in producing public spaces, and more generally, the change in the role of spatial design in the promotion of civic life. The project, if you like, is a step towards redressing the balance of attention paid to public spaces as social constructs, a lot, and to public spaces as human artifacts, a little. Consequently, we're concentrating on the role of design and the designer in the production of public spaces. Specifically, spaces that are designed to be public spaces, ensembles of buildings and spaces. This, we've discovered, is not easy. A 3D picture of the designer's ideal world, the designer's formation. I hope you all have a drink. Thank you for coming back. Right. Okay, where were we? Um, <clears throat> yes, we were talking about this. Uh, 
uh, method we're using which is to build up a, a 3D picture of the designer's idea world, the designer's formation, the designer's practice, the designer's design, the designer's client, and the planning context, the socio-economic context, and the political context, because designers don't design in vacuum. And this produces two analytical halves. Are they two halves of the same orange, or half an orange and half a pear, doomed to produce a real lemon? Well, we'll see. But as architecture, particularly the design of the civic, is a social art, there are numerous connections between the individual designer, the design, and the outside world, even if that design seems to be generating forms from the most private of associations. For example, one of our London modernist case studies is the South Bank Centre. <coughs> this actually shows the South Bank Centre plus the Royal Festival Hall, which is, uh, so the centre's here, and the Royal Festival Hall is here. This was built by the London County Council Architects Department between 1960 and 1968, after the Royal Festival Hall and before the National Theatre. It's a leading example of British brutalism, consisting of the Queen Elizabeth Hall, the Purcell Room, and the Hayward Gallery. And I'm sure you all know the strange egg crate roof of the Hayward Gallery. Norman Engelbach was the lead architect and driving force behind the design of the center, with a large team behind him, including three young members of Archigram, Ron Heron, Warren Chalk, and Dennis Crompton seconded from the LCC housing department. So they led rather interesting double lives for a while. When asked some time afterward why the South Bank Center looked the way it did, Warren Chalk, who was in charge of designing the walkways, said the original basic concept was to produce an anonymous pile subservient to a series of pedestrian walkways, a sort of map in terrace for people instead of goats, Mappin Terrace is the goat enclosure at London Zoo, and it looks like this. You can still see it. Now, this is a private association, the goat enclosure at London Zoo, made on the basis of form. But there's also a public association made on the basis of the city, a new post-war city, and what it could be. Part of what it could be was a new spatial realm for pedestrians, with traffic separated in its own spatial realm, each accommodating different speeds and needs. So Warren Chalk also said of the South Bank Centre, the design was one of the first attempts by the London County Council to recognize the conflict between the pedestrian and the motor vehicle. This was not seen only as a simple problem of segregation. The different nature of their moving was exploited. In other words, a new way of organizing urban circulation suggests new forms where this can happen. Form is where the private map in terrace and the public urban circulation meet and become public space. The architectural historian Ruth Lang observes in her study of the LCC, quote, being sandwiched between political intentions and local implementation, the architects of the LCC operated at a pivot point within the LCC's operational structure between city-scale aspirations and tectonic detail. This holds as true for architects designing public space today, of course, though more of an interior than an actual pivot point. The Brazilian academic Zula Lima emphasizes, quote, the unstable relationship between design intent and the ongoing negotiation of public and private spheres that architects have to continuously negotiate in delivering public space. So how do we study these complex negotiations between public and private? The comparative method helps. Comparing the public spaces of two cities in two different countries gives us a cultural perspective. And comparing modernist as well as contemporary public spaces gives us a temporal perspective. What has surprised us are the much greater differences between one time and another than between one culture and another. In both cities, 
And whether Sao Paulo was under democratic rule or, after 1965, a dictatorship, there was an understanding that the state would deliver with the public, public realm, and that the public realm was for the public good, or at least for the prestige of the city that produced it, and not for profit. Although Sao Paulo was constructing itself under the developmentalism pursued by both democratic and despotic governments, and London was reconstructing itself after a devastating war, architectural modernism provided a common platform for wide-ranging debates on architecture, urbanism, and civic life. This isn't to say that there weren't irreconcilable differences between modernists and others, and between modernists themselves. But for the first and perhaps the last time, state and architect in these two countries were engaged post-war in a radical partnership to build something new on a national scale, or at least to radically reconsider the old. The LCC's architects department, for example, was the largest in the world in the 1950s, with 1,500 staff, including 350 pro professional architects. Not that we allow ourselves to get too nostalgic about all this. Hand in hand with the assumption that the state would provide was the assumption that the state's handmaidens knew best, its technocratic planners and its often overweening architects. Public space was produced for the public, not with the public. If today architects have lost the power that came with a direct relationship with a fully engaged state, They've gained in terms of a much more sophisticated understanding of the co-produced nature of public space. Not simply the economic co-production of public-private partnerships that have been forced on them by a retreating state, but the co-production of designer and user, and the understanding that users can enrich or subvert a space, depending on whether it seeks to host them or control them. The French philosopher Michel de Certeau notes this co-constitution. He says, if it's true that a spatial order organizes an ensemble of possibilities, then the walker actualizes some of these possibilities. In that way, he makes them exist as well as emerge. But he also moves them about and he invents others, since the crossing, drifting away, or improvisation of walking, privilege, transform, or abandon spatial elements. This observation carries certain implications for the designer. It's clear that users are autonomous. They might complete a design, or they might try and subvert a design. Today, more thoughtful designers are negotiating a path between the lost mid-20th century dream of being at the center of power, and therefore agency, and a current depression about being relegated to the margins of power and therefore unable to contribute anything. A path between claiming too much authority and allowing hard-won expertise to be dismissed. Today, also, there are a multiplicity of roles for architects and for planners and for the public in the co-production of public space, which have been quietly pursued in London and Sao Paulo. And it's these, we think, may serve as models for future mainstream practice. In Sao Paulo, there has been the commissioning of designers by the city to create new public space at the edges of a reservoir currently polluted by an enormous favela. The formal and the informal, the professional and the citizen, working together in new ways. In London, planners trained as architects are facilitating the creation of a new public realm in Croydon that is spatially and visually literate to a degree impossible without this double vision of design and planning. Next summer, we'll be holding an exhibition and a symposium to engage as many of you as possible in discussions about their findings, our findings. And in the meantime, you can follow the project and access some of its work on the project website. We're just about to upload case study briefings for the modernist case studies that Neil Chisora has been slaving over for months, trapped in archives. So I hope you'll have a look at them. Thank you very much. <laughs>